Uh, it's my pleasure this afternoon to uh, introduce uh, John Wickman from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, John's a, a pretty special fellow in behavior analysis, and I perhaps better describe that in psychology in general. Uh, John got his PhD in uh, clinical psychology, it says on his Vita, from Emory University, but it's a very special kind of clinical psychology promoted by Jack McDowell, uh, which has uh, certain quantitative aspects to it. Uh, John is, uh, I'm quite sure, the only person who has ever been an associate editor of both JF and Memory and Cognition. I'm quite sure it's certainly one of his. He's either just begun or is about to begin, began a term as editor of Psychonomic Bulletin Review. Uh, today he's going to, to uh, tutor us in signal detection theory and the signal de 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 detection approaches. Uh, one of my favorite approaches to stimulus control because it has a place for reinforcement in it. And you'll discover that uh, this will be a very fine tutorial. And, and, uh, it turns out that uh, in his brief tenure, it's about 10 years now at uh, UCSD, uh, John has won five university-wide teaching awards. So you'll get an example of maybe how that's done. So it's a great pleasure I present uh, John Wixton. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, this, uh, presentation is uh, aimed at people who don't know a lot about signal detection theory, maybe have heard of it, uh, maybe know what the signal detection picture looks like, but they don't know maybe what D prime really is. They've heard of D prime, and I'm going to try to explain to you uh, what it really is by the end of this talk and why it's a useful measure. And this theory, I, which I quite like, uh, applies to a lot of different situations in the world and in the experimental laboratory. Uh, and that's one of the good things about this theory, is its broad applicability. And this first transparency, I just uh, briefly summarize some of the uh, situations to which the theory applies. This is the domain of signal detection theory. And uh, basically, you can divide them up into discrimination and detection tasks, although they are quite similar. And in a discrimination task, uh, you're asking, is it, is it one thing or another? You're trying to decide which it is, which of two alternatives. So, for example, a bartender might want to know, uh, are you, if there's a 21-year-old drinking age, are you older than 21 or are you younger than 21? Uh, that's an important discrimination. Or uh, uh, there's a lot of New Zealanders here, and I'm often faced with visiting students, and I'm trying to decide, is that a New Zealand accent I hear or an Australian accent? Uh, that's a discrimination task. And in an uh, animal memory task, delayed matching to sample, we present a pigeon with a, a red light or a green light, and then later on ask them to remember which it was. They have to remember which, whether it was red or green in order to pick the right key and get some food. That's a type of a discrimination task. So is it this or that? And uh, as I said, both real life and experimental laboratories are just full of tasks like this. You know, if you're, uh, is that is this an autistic child or some other developmental disability? And uh, on the radio driving to the airport uh, to come to Florida, I heard that there's going to be new $20 bills that they want you to pay attention to because they want you to try to decide uh, is it a counterfeit 20 or a genuine 20? And they've made it easier to form that discrimination, but just another discrimination task. And then closely related, there are detection tasks, which uh, the question is, did it happen or not? So you might be standing out in your backyard and wondering, did I just hear the telephone ring or not? That's a detection task. Or uh, your dentist might look at an x-ray of your tooth and try to decide, is that, is that a cavity I see there or not? Uh, and again, back to the Pigeon Memory Laboratory, I do tasks like this all the time uh, where uh, I present a light or not, or nothing happens at all, and then later on, uh, the pigeon has to decide 10 seconds later, what happened 10 seconds ago? Did a light occur or did nothing happen? It's a detection task. And uh, again, uh, these are very common. And so that's sort of its, the domain. And this transparency summarizes what it helps to explain. And it explains more than what I have up here, but, but as a start, uh, it helps you think through the two kinds of errors that you can make on tasks like, like this. Uh, so for example, you might, if you're a bartender trying to decide who to sell alcohol to, that's actually an example I'm going to continue with here because uh, it's an example that, that uh, people are familiar with and actually you're already probably familiar with some signal detection concepts, just not 
the formal representation of them. But anyway, uh, two kinds of errors can be made on all these tasks. In this case, deciding that an 18-year-old is old enough to drink, that's a mistake if there's a 21-year-old drinking age. And, uh, or someone who's 24, you might make the mistake of deciding that they're too young to drink. It helps you uh, think about the relationship between the errors on those two kinds of tasks, which uh, I'll get to in a moment. And more importantly, uh, it reveals that there's a difference between uh, what you might think of, as, think of as accuracy and bias. And accuracy uh, is basically the ability to differentiate between the two alternatives. How good you are at telling an 18-year-old apart from a 24-year-old. You have a certain ability to do that. Some people are good at it, some aren't. Separate from that is the tendency to preferentially choose one response over the other. Uh, you might just have a tendency to call lots of people too young to drink or old enough to drink. Those are, those are separate things. That might not be clear right now, but, but to try to make that clear and convince you that those are two separate things, what I thought I'd do is uh, describe a hypothetical experiment. And in this hypothetical experiment, hypothetical real world experiment, uh, we have 118 year olds and 124 year olds and they walk into a campus pub. And we have two bartenders vying for a position in this uh, pub. And we're testing their ability to tell the difference between 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds, because that's an important part of their job. Uh, I suppose they could just check ID, but we'll forget about that for the moment. Uh, and they have to decide who's old enough to drink and who's not. And we're going to test them on all 200 of these people and see how they do. And let's say we run that experiment and get these hypothetical results. We find that bartender A is 84% correct. 84% of the time, he gets the answer right in judging whether these people are old enough to drink or not. And bartender B is only 74% correct. Uh, that could happen. And here's the question. Which bartender is better able to differentiate between those who are old enough to drink and those who are too young? That's sort of the discrimination. Are you old enough or are you too young? Which is, which is better able to do that? Well, if you've never heard of signal detection theory uh, and don't really know what it means, you'll confidently pick bartender A. You'll say, no doubt about it. Look, 84% correct versus 74% correct. How could it be otherwise? Bartender A is is uh, better able to tell the difference between 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds, and maybe that's the bartender that should get the job. And it turns out that, that if you know signal detection theory, your response would be, well, you can't really tell just yet. Percent correct is not a good measure for trying to decide something like that. Uh, even though it seems like a natural, atheoretical measure to use, uh, it's not. So to develop that point a little bit, let's look at their performance in a little bit more detail. Uh, these are just hypothetical results that I've chosen for this. Okay. So all I've done here is plotted their performance for each bartender separately for the 18-year-olds and the 24-year-olds. Looked at their percent correct separately for those two. And for bartender A, um, he's 84% correct for the 18-year-olds and 16% errors. And 84% correct for the 24-year-olds and 16% errors. So uh, for the 18-year-olds, he mistakenly sells alcohol to 16% of them. But still, 84%, he correctly says, you're too young. And for the 24-year-olds, he sells alcohol to 84% of them, but incorrectly denies service to 16% of them. And on average, the average of 84 and 84 is 84. So there's his 84% correct. Bartender B, you see there's something different going on there. You can immediately see that. There's sort of an asymmetry in the errors. And you'll see that bartender B is being careful about selling alcohol illegally to someone who's too young to drink. So he's really accurate with the 18-year-olds, 98% correct, and only erring 2% of the time. Only 2% illegal sales. But he pays a price for that accuracy, and that is for the 24-year-olds, he's only 50% correct. 50% of the time he says, I'm sorry, you are too young to drink, even though they're not. And 50% of the time he realizes that they're old enough. Okay, so this is, there's something different. In addition to only being 74% correct, the average of, of, of 98 and 50 is overall 74% correct. There's something clearly different about, about his performance. And uh, signal detection theory is uh, a theory that helps you think through, I think, helps you think through differences like that and make sense of it. And in the end, will suggest that these two bartenders are equally uh, competent at differentiating 18-year-olds from 24-year-olds. They only differ in how careful they're being about making that, that one pretty bad mistake. So 
let me pursue that a bit. I'm sticking with this example for a while because I, I just think they're, they're, the concepts are fairly familiar. So, do all 18-year-olds look like they're 18? Obviously not. Some 18-year-olds look older than 18, some look younger than 18. You already know that that's true. Same with the 24-year-olds. It must be true that there's variability in how old they appear. Uh, this would be a very easy task if all 18-year-olds looked exactly 18 and all 24-year-olds looked exactly 24. You'd never make a mistake. The problem is they don't all look uh, their age. And that's represented this way in signal detection theory. So let's first look at this solid bell-shaped curve. Those are the 18-year-olds. Our hypothetical 100 people who are 18 years old. Um, and on this axis, I have a parent age. Their actual age is 18. This is their apparent age. And what that distribution shows is that uh, of those 118-year-olds, uh, they are more likely to appear to be 18 than any other age. That's why the, the distribution's highest point is centered right over 18. That just means that a f quite a few 18-year-olds actually look like they're 18. But uh, you can see that the curve is still pretty high over, say, 15. That means that quite a few also only look to be 15. Not as many look 18, but, but a fair number of 18-year-olds look like they're only 15. And down here at 12, the height of the curve is pretty low. That means not very many of those 18-year-olds look to be as young as 12, but there's still a couple. And virtually none look to be as young as 9. That's how you interpret this bell-shaped curve. Same on the other side of the curve. Quite a few of them look to be 21, some 24. Very few appear to be 27. So that's just one way of representing the variability that, that you intuitively can appreciate exists. Um, same with the 24-year-olds. Well, of those 124-year-olds, they're more likely to look 24 than any other age, so there's lots of 24-year-olds who actually look 24, but there are uh, quite a few who look to be 27, a few who look to be 30, and very few who look to be 33. Okay, so that's, that's how, in signal detection theory, you represent that variability. Um, these distributions are called normal distributions, bell-shaped curves, and signal detection theory makes the assumption that, that these are normal distributions. You don't have to make that assumption, and you might reasonably question that assumption. There's, there's good reasons for believing that this is a close approximation to whatever the truth might be, but I'm not going to go into those good reasons. I'm just pointing out that those are assumptions. Uh, there are certain nice properties of these normal distributions that help a lot in a signal detection analysis. It also assumes, typically, that these two distributions are, have the same variability, that one is not wider than the other. They're, they're just like that. They're equally, equally variable. So those are two assumptions uh, that I'm just going to make and are typically made in signal detection theory. All right. Well, you can see that these distributions overlap. And that's what makes this a difficult discrimination. Some of these 24-year-olds look like they're only 18. Some of these 18-year-olds look like they're 24. They're, the distribution is sort of mixed together. That's what makes it difficult. And the way you solve this task, according to signal detection theory, is you just pick a cutoff point on this axis and say, anyone who looks older than that, I'm deciding you're old enough to drink. Anyone who looks younger than that, uh, I'm not going to sell them any alcohol. And what bartender A did uh, to get data like that is set a cutoff right at 21. So I have that illustrated here. So the top part of this graph is the same as uh, the last transparency, except I've added a, a decision criterion. That's that vertical line right at 21. And that's the decision rule that bartender A uses. Anyone who appears to be older than 21, this bartender A decides you look old enough to drink to me. And anyone who looks younger than 21, the decision is, uh, sorry, too young. And you can see that uh, in this plot that some of the 18-year-olds exceed that decision criterion. In fact, that's this area right in here. About, as I have it drawn, 16% of the 18-year-olds look like they're older than 21, and so bartender A sells them a drink. Uh, and I have the percent correct reproduced down here in the way that you typically do it in a two-by-two two table. Signal detection theory arranges data like that. So here's the decision, either too young or old enough. Here are the 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds. And you can see that 84% of the 18-year-olds are correctly judged to be too young. But 16%, this area I have shaded in, are mistakenly judged to be old enough. 
of the 24-year-olds, similarly, 84% of them look older than 21. 16%, this is an error, uh, again, right there, appear to be younger than 21 and don't get a drink sold to them incorrectly. So these are the correct responses. I have them in bold. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, and these are the incorrect responses. The same data I have over there just represented in a two-by-two two table. So according to a detection analysis, that's what bartender A did. It's quite reasonable to set the criterion at 21 and decide that if you look older than 21, you're old enough to drink. Bartender B uh, is doing something different. doesn't quite fit on this one. I'll show you one. Everything is the same about bartender B in this hypothetical example. That is, the distributions overlap to the exact same extent, extent for bar, uh, bartender B as for bartender A. The only difference is the second bartender is being more cautious. He set his cutoff point at 24. I'm not going to sell you a drink unless you look older than 24 because I don't want to make the mistake of selling alcohol to minors. So he sets his criterion at 24, unlike bartender A. And by doing that, he cuts way down on these errors. Now only 2% of the 18-year-olds appear to be old enough to drink or are judged to be old enough to drink. And 98% are correctly judged to be too young. So by being more conservative, uh, he avoids making that mistake that you don't want to make if you're a bartender. But the price you pay for that is a lot of the 24-year-olds now fall below your decision criterion. In fact, as I have it drawn there, 50% of the 24-year-olds are judged to be too young. That's the price you pay. Okay, so these bartenders, the fact that the distributions overlap to an identical degree means, this is a point I'll develop, that they are equally able to tell the difference between 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds. They're equally able to do that. The only difference between them is their bias to decide who's old enough and who's too young. That's the only difference. One's being more careful. And uh, just at the bottom there, there's that two-by-two two table again. 98% correct and 2% errors. Uh, what I have there is 14% gain. You see, compared to bartender A over there, who was 84% correct for the 18-year-old, uh, bartender B is 98% correct. There's a gain of 14% correct. And the price you pay is a loss in percent correct for the 24-year-old. And in fact, there's a 34% loss. So it's an unequal change, only because of the shapes of these bell-shaped curves. That's why. Um, and that's one reason why percent correct is not a very good measure, because even if, even if the only things that changing is how careful you're being, percent correct won't stay constant. And in fact, another way of thinking about it is, if the next day we brought bartender, here's bartender A making 16% errors. We brought him back to the, the, the bar the next day and said, look, you did real well. You got 84% correct. But we're going to do the experiment again today. And this time, I want you to be careful not to sell alcohol to minors. You know, just be more careful. This time. Be more confident that they're old enough to drink before you judge them to be old enough. And maybe bartender B will respond, uh, bartender A will respond by shifting his criterion over to 24 the way bartender B did. And if he does, and everything else stays constant, his percent correct will also drop to 74% correct. He'll be just like the other bartender. Not because his ability to tell the difference between 18 and 24 year olds has changed at all. It hasn't. It's exactly the way it was yesterday. The only, that, the only thing that's different is he's being more cautious. He's, he's being, you know, you have to look older than 24 before you sell them a drink. That's the only difference. And percent correct changes. See, that's why percent correct is not a great measure. It doesn't tell you exactly what has changed. Now, it could be. In, in this hypothetical example, the distributions overlap the same for these two bartenders. And I did that so I could make the point uh, that they could have the same ability to differentiate and just have a difference in bias. But it could have been that uh, the overlap of the distributions for bartender A differed from the overlap for bartender B, and that's why percent correct changed. So just very briefly, I'm going to show you an example. So it could have been uh, in the upper panel there, that's, that's just uh, bartender A again. 
And it could have been that bartender B was not as good at guessing people's age, that for the 18-year-olds there was much wider variability, and for the 24-year-olds there was much wider variability in his guesses as to how old somebody is. And that would make the distributions overlap even more. These two groups, of, these two populations would be all intermingled in his eyes. Um, and that would make percent correct go down as well. So there's two reasons why percent correct could change. One is you're just being more cautious, but your ability to tell the difference hasn't changed. The other could be uh, like this. I'm not going to pursue this. I'm just pointing out at this stage that the other reason percent correct could, could have been worse, let's say we have a bartender C, is because the distributions overlap more. The two populations appear to this person to be more intermingled. So percent correct won't do it. What we want, we want one measure that tells us how much the distributions overlap. That tells us your ability to distinguish between the two populations. And then we want a second measure to tell us how conservative you're being, where you're putting that decision criterion. Because those are the two things that determine performance. And they're both mixed together in percent correct. OK. And by the end of this talk, uh, signal detection theory hopefully will have uh, provided you with those two separate measures. One measure is not enough, we need two. We need one to tell us how much the distributions overlap, because that captures how, how difficult the task is for this person. And separately, where do they put their decision criterion? Now, to understand the two measures that signal detection theory provides, one of them is D prime that, that, that most people, or lots of people have heard of, you have to understand uh, a basic property of normal distributions. So, just very briefly here, there's, there are three distributions for 18-year-olds for, say, three different people. The person on top, uh, and that's apparent age again on the x-axis, for the person on top, that person's pretty good at guessing the age of of 18-year-olds. He gets fooled a little bit. Uh, some 18-year-olds look up to 24, some down to 12, but, but not, it's, it's pretty narrow range. He's pretty good at guessing well, the age of 18-year-olds. And that distribution has a standard deviation of two years, and that's that little line that I have drawn across with an arrow pointing to it. That's a property of a normal distribution called a standard deviation. A lot of you know that. Uh, it's just a measure of the width of these distributions, and the, the, the range that they cover. So the middle, uh, picture is, is the one I've been using for the, these, this is the bartenders. Both of them that, that I've been talking about uh, have a standard deviation of three years. That is, for these, these people aren't quite as good at guessing the age of an 18-year-old. There's a bit more variability, and that's reflected in the second property of a normal distribution. It has a mean of 18, but its width, its standard deviation is three years. And then down at the bottom is someone who's even less able to guess age well. Uh, for this person, the standard deviation is four years, that his guesses are all over the place from way above 18 years of age to way below 18 years of age. And individuals could differ on that measure. And there's some nice properties of a normal, of, of a normal distribution having to do with the standard deviation that allow you to come up with the measures that we're interested in coming up with. One measure for how much the distributions overlap, second measure for where the criterion is placed. Well, uh, if you take a statistics class, you'll learn that roughly 68% of the scores fall within one standard deviation of the mean, roughly. Here's the mean of 18, here's the standard deviation of two. For this person, 68 out of 100 people are 18 plus or minus two. About 96%, so really 95 and a half or something like that, uh, fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And so here are some uh, specific examples that go along with the top panel and bottom panel here. Uh, if the mean is 18 and the standard deviation is 2, like for this person on the top here, what that means is that 68% of the of the 18-year-olds appear to have an age between 16 and 20. That is the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. 96% appear to have an age between 14 and 22. That's the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Okay, it's just, now why is it 68 and 96%? Why, why, why are normal distributions that way? Well, that's just the way they are. Gauss figured it out, I don't know how long ago, uh, and we don't really need to quarrel with him. If we assume normal distributions, these facts are true. Okay, 
that's one reason why we assume normal. Lots of things in the world are normally distributed. We're hoping that, that uh, apparent age is too. We don't know for a fact that it is, but it's not an unreasonable assumption. Uh, and this bottom example, for this person who's not as good at guessing an age, 68% uh, of the scores fall between 14 and 22. That's 18 plus or minus one standard deviation. 96% of the scores fall between 10 and 26. So, you know, for the bottom panel, that's a more variable experience. That's what a standard deviation is. Those are its properties. The 68% and 96%, those are useful properties. Uh, you can figure things out by knowing that. So, here's a more abstract. It happens to be true of any normal distribution. I've rounded the numbers a little bit just to make things so I don't have fractional percentages. Any normal distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. All normal distributions, all bell-shaped curves are that way. IQ, for example, has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Immediately, if you know those two pieces of information, you know that 68% of IQs in the United States fall between 100 plus 15 and 100 minus 15. That's just the way standard deviations are. So 34% fall within the mean plus one standard deviation, another 34, the mean minus one standard deviation. 68% of scores for all bell-shaped curves, all normal distributions, fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 96% roughly within two standard deviations. That's, that's the mean plus, plus two standard deviations. That's the mean minus two standard deviations. 14 plus 34 plus 34 plus 14, 96% of the scores fall in that range. Okay? I'm going to refer back to this when I show you what D prime is. So uh, these are important properties to be aware of. Okay, well, I have indicated earlier that we don't want to know percent correct. We want to know two separate things. How much do the distributions overlap? Because that tells you how hard it is for the person to tell the difference between the two alternatives. And second, what is uh, their bias? And I'm now going to introduce the measure of distributional overlap, which is called D prime. That's what you really want. What's D prime? Because that tells you, uh, I don't want to know percent correct, I want to know D prime, because that tells me how much the distributions overlap. You know, I better trade. Okay, the middle panel is the example I've been using, but I show two other examples just to illustrate. Here are three D primes. I haven't told you what they are yet, but uh, D prime varies with the degree to which these distributions overlap. The more they overlap, the lower D prime is. Even if they overlapped completely, so you couldn't tell the difference between the two groups at all, D prime would be zero. Here's an example of D prime equal to one. They overlap a whole lot. Here's the example I have been using, D prime equals two. They overlap less. Here they overlap even less. These 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds overlap hardly at all because this person's really good at guessing their, the correct age. That's a D prime of three. So if you're reading an article and somebody reports a D prime of two, for example, and you know, when I read an article and somebody says D prime equals two, I can immediately call to mind this picture. I know about how much the distributions overlap. If somebody says D prime is three or four, I know these distributions hardly overlap at all and performance is really good. And if somebody says the D prime is 0.3, I, notice, I know that this person can hardly differentiate between the two alternatives because it's a measure of distributional overlap. And what it is more precisely, it's the difference between the means, not in years, these are all six years apart, these are 18 year olds versus 24 year olds, it's a difference between means in terms of stan standard deviations. How many standard deviations apart are these two means? So here's an example where the bell-shaped curves have a standard deviation of six years. The means are six years apart, so those means are one standard deviation apart. Six divided by six is one, that's what D prime is. The distributions for bartenders A and B that I've been talking about, uh, I haven't mentioned it, I think, but the standard deviation for those distributions is three years. I chose these distributions so they'd have means of 18 and 24 and standard deviations of three. So the means are six years apart, standard deviations three. So those means for, for this, for bartenders A and B, those means are two standard deviations apart, six divided by three. And for some other person who's better able to differentiate between the two alternatives, uh, the standard deviation is only two. So these means are three standard deviations apart, D prime equals three. Okay, so that D prime tells you 
one important fact that you want to know. How much do the distributions overlap? The more they overlap, the lower D prime is. And to be able to interpret D prime, you have to know what a standard deviation is, because D prime is how far apart the means are relative to the standard deviation. Okay. Uh, we'll talk more about why this is exactly a D prime of two and how, how you figure that out. But for the moment, I'm just saying this is both bartender A and bartender B have a D prime of two, which means they are both equally able to differentiate between the two alternatives. Separate from distributional overlap, is where you put your criterion. And that's the bias measure. There's various ways of quantifying bias. I'm just choosing one of those ways for, to, for purposes of this talk. Okay, these are all a D prime of two. The, the, the means are two standard deviations apart for all three of these examples. The only difference is where the, this, the decision criterion is placed. Here is what bartender A did. It placed the criterion right where the two distributions intersect, right in the middle, which is not an unreasonable place to put a decision criterion. And we call that a bias of zero, according to one way of quantifying bias. This person doesn't prefer one response over the other, gives the two responses equally often by placing that criterion right at age 21. That was bartender A. Bartender B, on the other hand, as I've already gone through, was biased. He, he didn't want to sell alcohol to minors, so he was more, he put his decision criterion at age 24. That happens to be one standard deviation above the mean. Remember, the standard deviation is three years. And just as D prime is a measure of standard deviations in a way, uh, so is bias. So bartender A had a D prime of two and a bias of zero. Bartender B also had a D prime of two, was equally able to differentiate, but had a bias of plus one. That means his criterion was moved one standard deviation past the point of intersection to avoid making these mistakes. and willing to pay the cost of making many more mistakes with the 24-year-olds. And we could have had somebody else who didn't want to miss any alcohol sales. Uh, so this person would be biased in the other direction, basically concluding that almost everybody is old enough to drink. And he put his criterion down at 18. Anyone who looks older than 18, even though the, drink, the law says in this particular place that you have to be 21, uh, I'm going to sell you alcohol anyway. And that would be a bias of minus one, because his criterion is one standard deviation to the left of the middle. Okay, so these are the two, it's not percent correct that you want to know, it's these two separate pieces of information. How much do the distributions overlap? And what is the person's bias? Are they right in the middle? The errors are even Steven, or are the errors unequal in one way or another? Okay. Now, what I, what I haven't said yet is, uh, how do you get from, what, from the information you have after you run your experiment to D prime and bias? You know, I've been showing you what D prime and bias are, trying to, trying to make that clear, but I haven't said how you actually make the step. All you really have are those percent correct measures when you run your experiment. You know, we know bartender A is 84% correct with the 18 year olds and 84% correct with the 24 year olds. How do you go from there to a D prime of two and a bias of zero? You know, how do you go to that picture and those numbers? That's, that's what I'd like to turn to now, because it's not that hard. Uh, and let's take a look at how you actually do that. Here's bartender A again. 18-year-olds, 24-year-olds, criterion right in the middle. Here's his performance, 84% correct for both 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds, 16% errors in both cases. And this information in the two-by-two two table, that's what you have after you're done with the experiment. And there's a way to go from those pieces of information straight to this picture and those D primes and bias measures without too much difficulty. How do you do that? Uh, well, like this. First, uh, it's useful to note or, or to, to do one thing that, that may cause you some consternation. Um, that middle graph there, up here, I have a parent age 
uh, for our bartender A and bartender B. And you can see it goes from 6, 9, 12, you know, 18. The midpoint is 21 years of age. What I've done in uh, this graph is it's the exact same picture as that, but I've relabeled the x-axis just for convenience. You can put any labels you want on that axis. I've been using aids to try to get the concepts across, but really we don't know uh, what those values are for a lot of tasks. I chose the age discrimination because it makes sense of what the x-axis is, but in many, many discriminations, like telling the difference between a New Zealander's accent and Australia's, someone from Australia, their accent, uh, we don't really know what that measure is. Uh, you can't really quantify it as easily as age. And amazingly, that doesn't matter, uh, as I hope to be able to communicate in a minute here. So I've taken off age now, moving one more level into the abstract. Um, and I've labeled the midpoint zero. It used to be 21, but now I'm calling it zero. I could call it 42.3 if I wanted to. I'm just calling it zero for the sake of simplicity. And these other numbers are now also in standard deviation units. Signal detection theory and standard deviations go together. So this it was 21, this was 18. Now this is zero, and this is minus one standard deviation. Okay? Because a, a point I hope to be able to make is you don't need to know those ages. That was just for communicating the ideas. Uh, and let's see why you don't, and how you go from these numbers to that picture. Again, we're relying on the properties, the known properties of a normal distribution. We have assumed that these distributions are normal distributions of equal standard deviations. Well, you run your experiment and you find out these are the, fun these are the data, that, that bartender A is 84% correct for both 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds. What's the D prime and what's the bias? Well, let's take a look at this uh, more abstract normal distribution. Let's imagine uh, that this is the distribution for the 18-year-olds, just for the moment. And we want to know where, we know that he's 84% correct with the 18-year-olds. That means for the 18-year-olds, 84% are judge, correctly judged to be too young. So where must the decision criterion be placed in order for that to be true? That's the question. And it turns out there's only one place you can put it. So these are the 18-year-olds. Whatever the mean is, and whatever the standard deviation is, the only place you can put the criterion and be 84% correct is one standard deviation above the mean. And you can see that if you put it there, 14 plus 2, 16% will fall above the criterion. Those are errors. 84% will fall to the other side. So given that this person is 84% correct and 16% incorrect for the 18-year-olds, it must be the case that his criterion is placed, is situated one standard deviation above the mean of the 18-year-olds. Whatever the mean of the 18-year-olds is, we don't really know. I've been saying it's 18, but let's say we don't know what it is. And whatever the standard deviation is, we don't know that either, it must be one standard deviation above that mean. If it were anywhere else, it wouldn't be 84% and 16%. It'd be some other percent correct values. So knowing these properties of a normal distribution and looking at the data, we can figure out that First piece of information, the criterion is set one standard deviation above the mean of the 18-year-olds. Now, let's imagine that this is the distribution for the 24-year-olds, and let's just do the same thing. Well, for the 24-year-olds, 84% of them fall to the right of the criterion, but those are correct responses, and 16% fall to the left. So where must the decision criterion be placed with respect to the 24-year-olds? Well, again, there's only one place to put it, where 84% will fall to the right and 16% will fall to the left. And that's right here. The criterion must be one standard deviation below the mean of the 24-year-olds. Whatever the mean is, whatever the standard deviation is, it must be one standard deviation to the left. Leaving 16% to the left of the criterion, judged to be too young incorrectly, and 84% to the right, judged to be old enough correctly. So by making uh, use of this information, known properties of a bell-shaped normal distribution, we can take these percent corrects and, learn, and, and immediately figure out that 
the decision criterion is one standard deviation above the mean of the 18-year-olds and one standard deviation below the mean of the 24-year-olds. The only way those two things could simultaneously be true is with a picture like that. The 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds must be two standard deviations apart from each other because it's the criterion is one standard deviation above the mean of the 18-year-olds and one standard deviation below the mean of the 24-year-olds. The 18 and 24-year-old distributions must be two standard deviations apart. Couldn't be any other way. And that's how we've gone from these numbers to a d prime of two, a bias of zero. And we're able to even draw this picture to represent what's going on in the situation. Let me do one more example, at least one more, because this part seems esoteric to people sometimes. Let's do the same computations for bartender B. Remember, this was the picture for bartender B, except for I've changed the x-axis, so now I still zero, I'm calling zero the point of intersection between the two distributions. Zero just means the midpoint now. In my previous examples, that was 21 years of age. It's now the midpoint. Well. For the 18-year-olds, he's 98% correct and 2% error. That means that 98% of the 18-year-old distribution falls to the left of the criterion. So where must the criterion be for that to be true? Well, it must be way up here at two, two standard deviations above the mean. It can't be anywhere else. 2% fall above it. The remaining 98% fall below it. So whatever the mean and standard deviation happen to be for the 18-year-old distribution. One thing we know for sure, if these are bell-shaped curves, is that the criterion is placed two standard deviations above that mean. Just looking at these percentages, we can figure that out. Now, what about the 24-year-olds? Well, it's 50-50. Let's imagine this is the distribution for the 24-year-olds now. Where can we place the criterion such that 50% fall to the left and 50% fall to the right? Well, there's only one place to put it, and that's smack on the mean. 34 plus 14 plus 2 is 50% fall to one side, 50% fall to the other. So by using that information there, we know, and these data, we know that, that the criterion is two standard deviations to the right of the mean of the 18-year-olds, and it's right on top of the mean for the 24-year-olds. The only way that could be true is if, again, the 18-year-olds and 24-year-old distributions, their means were two standard deviations apart, There's no other way that, that those two, the, the two separate facts that we computed could simultaneously be true unless the means were two standard deviations apart and the criterion is right on the mean of the 24-year-olds, which happens to be one standard deviation above the point of intersection, which we've labeled zero. So now we wouldn't make that mistake that I referred to in the beginning of taking this percent correct. If, and yes, he's only 74% correct, but but if you're a signal detection theorist, you realize that could be true even if his d prime is also 2, 2.0, which it is in this example. It's just that when you run the numbers, you find out d prime equals 2. And the, only, what the real difference in performance is that this observer is more biased, more often chooses the too young category. And this esoteric point, it seems strange to people and magic that you don't have to know what that axis is. You don't have to, like earlier it was age, and I was showing you 18, 21, 24, just to try to make it concrete. And now I'm saying, but you don't really have to know that. All you need to know are these percentages, and everything can be worked out. So let me just show you an example like that. One more concrete computation here. Uh, I'm going to leave all the, all the numbers are going to be identical. I'm just switching the task. And this is the task that I referred to before that I sometimes have to do, especially in behavior analysis. There's so many New Zealanders involved. Uh, you meet a lot of them. And you have to, sometimes you're faced with trying to decide, is this an Australian or a New Zealand accent that I'm listening to? And I think my performance is, everything's going to be the same. I'm just changing what the task is. This is just another discrimination task. So the decision, uh -huh, you're from New Zealand, or the decision is you're from, you're, you're, that's an Australian accent I hear. And this is sort of the, the axis. This isn't age anymore. It's something like what their accent sounds like to you. Uh, and on average, New Zealanders sound different than Australian people from Australia, than Australians. 
Uh, but we don't really know. You know you can tell the difference if you listen to them. You're, you're telling the difference along some dimension. You just don't know exactly what it is, and you can't put numbers to it. But my performance, I think, over the years is something like this. That is, when I encounter somebody who's truly from New Zealand, I tend to correctly identify them as being from New Zealand. Ha, huh, that's a New Zealand accent that I hear in your voice. I think I do anyway. So maybe I'm 98% correct, and only 2% of the time mistakenly call a New Zealander Australian, which they don't like. Uh, and, uh, but Australians, I almost, uh, very often I identify them as being New Zealanders when these students come over from Australia and study at UCSD. Uh, I make that mistake. So maybe my performance would be about 98% correct with the New Zealanders and only about 50% correct with the Australians. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, even though I don't know what this axis is exactly, and I don't know what the means and standard deviations are, I can step through the calculations in the identical way that I just did. That is, I can say, well, uh, let's imagine this is the distribution of, of how the accent sounds uh, if it's a New Zealander speaking. And I know that I'm 98% correct identifying, identifying them as being from New Zealand. It must be the case that my criterion is two standard deviations above the mean of that distribution, whatever the heck it is. It can't be anywhere else. And I can also compute that uh, for the Australian distribution that my criterion must be right on the mean of that distribution. Whatever that mean happens to be, because I'm calling 50% of them New Zealanders and 50% of them Australians. Having no idea what the true means and standard deviations are. So you don't have to know that because of these properties of a normal distribution. And I come up with the exact same values. My D prime is 2.0, that is the distributions overlap a bit, uh, but I'm biased to identify, because I've been to New Zealand, and so maybe that, that causes me to uh, too often use the New Zealand response and I haven't been to Australia. Okay, and a final point here. Just one more quick example. If you live in New Zealand or Australia, you're probably a lot better at this than I am. That is, the distributional overlap would be quite a bit less. So you might see someone, if you ran this experiment with somebody from New Zealand or Australia, you might find that they're 98% correct for both You might find something like that. They're a lot better. And I won't step you through the computations, but if you step through the computations, you'll come up with a D prime of four and a bias of zero. What that means is, for someone who actually lives in New Zealand, this is a much easier discrimination. The distributions overlap much less than they do for me, because I live over here. And, but if you run the experiment and get their numbers, you can make that computation. You can figure out what, what uh, the difference between the distributions is and whether or not they happen to be biased. People usually want to use, there's a strong pull to use percent correct in, in, in measuring performance on tasks like this. But one of the first things that people learn when they're introduced to this theory, and it's a really useful lesson, is that that is not a good measure. It seems atheoretical and, and, and easy to understand, but it combines two separate pieces of information that you don't want combined. You want them separated out, ability to tell the difference and bias. And signal detection theory gives you one very straightforward, fairly simple way to do it if you just uh, assume a normal distribution. Okay, that's it. can deal with that problem uh, by still using normal distributions of unequal variance. See, I have these two distributions that are equal. If you're dealing with skewed distributions, what sometimes gives you a reasonable approximation of that situation, because skewed distributions are never going to have the same variance. You know, the one that's lower on the axis versus the one that's higher, uh, they're never going to have the same variance. Uh, and you can do the signal detection analysis relaxing the assumption of equal variance, letting the uh, one further up, the Australians in this case, have greater variance. And it turns out that that provides a pretty good approximation of skewed distributions, not bad. So you can, and, and you can compute your D prime measure from that 
uh, representation and not be too far off the mark. But the other thing you can do, if it happens to be a distribution where uh, the percentages are well worked out, you can still do uh, the D prime calculation. It gets a, it gets a little murky uh, because if the, if the standard deviations are unequal, uh, it's not as simple to come up with a measure that captures the degree to which the two distributions overlap. There, there are a whole set of issues that, that arise, but it, by no means impossible. Um, there are some people who like percent correct, who like to use two percent correct. Percent correct given that the person really is 18, or percent correct given that the person really is 24, or sensitivity and selectivity, or they're all sorts of work. Um, so that's two pieces of information, and you use two pieces of yes. information. Why should I prefer your two pieces of information? So why not just use the two percent correct and leave it at that? Why? Well, what if I asked you, who's better able at differentiating between 18-year-olds and 24-year-olds? Uh, Bartender A or bartender B? Well, you'd have your two pieces of information, but you'd be stuck trying to answer that question. <laughs> you'd be stuck trying to answer that question. You just have your two pieces of information. You have to do the rest of the analysis to say that uh, the D primes are the same, and so they are equally able to differentiate between the two alternatives. But aren't you left without a theory, uh, without a normative theory of where the decision criterion is? So you can't really say that one person's decision criterion is better than the other, so you can't say. Maybe one. All I'm, uh, I'm not saying it's not a question of, of what's optimal. It's just a question of how difficult is it to differentiate between these two alternatives for these two observers. And as I said, bartender A, we could change nothing about his behavior the next day except telling him to be more careful. We haven't changed his ability to tell the difference between 18 year old and 24 year old. We've just made him more conservative. And you might think with those two pieces of information, that, aha. I think maybe he's having trouble differentiating between them now, whereas before he didn't. And if you do the rest of the detection analysis, you discover that, no, we've just shifted his decision criteria, and we haven't made it harder for him to tell the difference between those two alternatives. So that's why it's, it's useful to go beyond these 2%. It's better to have these two separate percent correct measures than the one overall combined, which is what people usually want to do. But still, there's another step to go. Yes, question? Is the assumption of normality a reasonable ass assumption? Is that the main question you're asking in, in, in various tasks? W well, well, let me, if, even if that isn't exactly what you're asking, let me address that, because that's a common question. When I first encountered signal detection theory, I said, yeah, sounds good, but you're assuming normal distributions. They could be anything. You know, why assume normality? Well, one reason, one practical reason that buys you all that information right there, but, but you want more than that. You know, I mean, it could be a log normal distribution, a gamma distribution, a beta distribution. You know, why a normal distribution? Not, you know, lots of things in the world are normally distributed, but certainly not everything is normally distributed. Why assume that this is normally distributed? Well, um, there's a whole, you know, if I had a part two lecture, I'd go straight to that question. Uh, and the answer is you can never prove that these are normal distributions. You can't. You know that, like, especially for the 18-year-olds, you know they must be distributed some way. Not all 18-year-olds appear to be 18. There must be some distribution, but you don't know that they're normal distributions. And you can never prove that they are. However, you can test the hypothesis. You can prove, if you're badly wrong about that assumption, you can prove that you're wrong. And so you can at least take that next step and test the assumption. The way you do it, I'll just mention it without telling you what it is, it's a ROC analysis, receiver operator characteristic, where you manipulate bias across conditions. So we take bartender A, and you know, he starts off unbiased, then we make him biased one way, then we make him biased the other way. And you, from those data that you get, you can plot out what's called an ROC. Um, and the way those points fall on that plot provides a test of the assumption that these are normal distributions. And what you usually find when you do that test is that uh, the normal distributions provide a reasonable fit to the data. Now, there are other distributions that do that, too. But at least you've attempted to disprove this hypothesis, and it does a pretty good fit. And so it pr probably provides a reasonable approximation. I guess we're done. <laughs>